Hello, everyone, and welcome to a new episode of When Life Happens, the podcast about mental growth. Today, I will go in conversation with John Portelli. We speak about poetry, trauma, education, and how these three will intertwine. But most interesting is perhaps the fact that John is going to tell us why and how poetry is breaking boundaries. Dear John, thank you for your wisdom, your words, and your love. Welcome, John, in the podcast. Thank you for wanting to participate. So let's talk about trauma, education, and poetry, because those three things are in common with us. Uh, we met actually a couple of years ago during a congress and kept in touch. And now we're sitting here. You're in Malta. I'm in the Netherlands. And we are going to, to speak about all those subjects. Okay, so thank you, Simone, for inviting me. I'm glad to do this. Uh, hopefully, it will be of some help to whoever. <laughs> whoever is out there. Only reaching one person, then you win, right? It's fine. Yeah. So I am just uh, starting right away. Um, I was reading an interview, an, an interview you sent me, and there uh, was a line where you say, okay, poetry is also about breaking boundaries. Do you see a connection between poetry and trauma? Okay, so um, you, you, you chose a very nice quote, I think. Um, uh, and, and I will connect it with trauma, okay? So poetry is about uh, breaking boundaries. Um, because in my view, um, the role of poetry is to transgress, to go mm -hmm. beyond. Um, poetry can focus on very common things, but, but, the, but good poetry uh, focuses on common things in a, in a very uncommon way. And that uncommon way which we usually associate with creativity because it's going beyond the normal, however we conceive of the normal, um, is an act of transgression. It's an act of going beyond, okay? Um, and this is what I mean by poetry is about breaking boundaries. Uh, it's going beyond. So, so uh, boundaries can be physical, Boundaries can be psychological, spiritual, and so on, okay? So I'm referring to all kinds of boundaries, whether they are material, metaphorical, and so on. Do you now, think that, sorry for interrupting, that with poetry you can break those boundaries of all those concepts? Material, well, I think I think good poetry, good poetry, manages to do that, I think. What good is good poetry? poetry? Well, good poetry is, is writing, which is uh, bubbling with emotions and at the same time, full of an intellectual element. Intellectual is not academic, of course, okay? So good poetry brings those two together. Uh, it is also full of images, metaphors, and the more the metaphors and images are fresh. Uh, I think the stronger, the stronger is the possibility of breaking the boundaries. Because if we use metaphors and images uh, that have been used and overused, then of course we are reproducing those boundaries and we are not breaking the boundaries. Okay. Now, when we break boundaries, of course, we are trying to make connections. We are trying to develop another kind of relationship which boundaries block. Mm -hmm. Now, here, I think, is one possible connection with trauma. Because it seems to me um, what trauma does, among other things, it creates a certain blockage. Exactly. It will, it right? Uh, it creates a certain blockage on the basis of certain experiences uh, and, and sometimes also 
blockages on the perceptions and sometimes misperceptions of the experience. Okay, now, of course, we can get into, but who is going to judge the experience? I will not go there, but mm -hmm. I'm not interested in that. The fact of the matter is we have to accept that someone has experienced something or someone has experienced something which has created a perception, which has created the blockage. Full stop. That's it. Now, the question is, what can we do beyond that? Rather than trying to say, what is the cause? Is it true that this is like this? Is this person imagining? Irrelevant. For, for me, what is important and relevant to the human existence is that someone is truly feeling in this manner and someone has a blockage, has a trauma, and this person has to break boundaries of some sort. So poetry, I think, can be helpful because it may, through the act of catharsis, mm -hmm. uh, poetry can help uh, break the, uh, the blockage that a trauma uh, has created for a human being. I think poetry can. Now, it could be either poetry that the person herself or himself writes, or it could be poetry uh, that she or he reads and it helps them to cure themselves from the blockage by transgressing, going beyond the blockage. Mm -hmm. okay. Did it, so, then I interrupt you in that because then no, I go no, to, 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 another, to another sentence you, you quoted, I quote you, and you said, okay, when I was around 15, 16, I didn't got my exams and the only thing I am good at was being thrown into the fire. Yes. When yeah. I read when I read those words, I think, okay, that is a youth with a lot of aspects of traumatic experiences. Of course, and it was it was a traumatic experience. I mean, yeah. the last year, the last year of formal schooling that I attended in Malta in 1968-69 was very traumatic for me. Absolutely traumatic. I, I, I am open about this. It, it created a massive depression on me, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and I got no help, neither from the school, mm, nor from the family, as far as I know, although my recollection is not very clear, because, of course, I was so much engulfed by this depression. Maybe they were very helpful by being... Uh, by listening to me, by supporting me in ways that were and may still be unknown to me, okay? But we never openly spoke about uh, depression openly. This was a time in Malta when uh, to be in a depression is seen as being something completely abnormal and you hide under the carpet, okay? Exactly. Uh, but, but, but I remember um, being extremely sad and extremely depressed to the extent that I wasn't able to focus on anything. I mean, you know, I couldn't focus on anything. The only thing that I could focus on, and now I realize why, was, was football, sports. Because, of course, it gave me energy, it gave me some hope, and, and through the exercise... It, it helps the chemical imbalance and, yes, exactly. and it helps you deal with, with the depression. Ironically, both at the family level and at school, they were saying, you are doing too much sports, don't do sports, which is not helpful at all, of course, okay? Yeah. But yes, that, that, was, <coughs> that was traumatic. <coughs> and I started writing poetry a few months after I experienced that traumatic experience, okay? Yeah, that but, was uh, my next question, actually. So uh, how did the writing of poetry help you? 
The writing of the poetry helped me a lot. Um, I still have some. I was uh, looking in an old box in, in an old garage of my family's uh, uh, estate, one of the houses. And I found a box a few months ago where I found my writing from, you know, 1969, 1970, mm -hmm. with a little typewriter. I remember the typewriter. And, um, and I read them, and um, they were very revealing because it reveals the anxiety, uh, the depression that I was going through at this relatively young age, 15, 16, 17. Uh, and it was, I mean, not good poetry in comparison to what I write today, it was not good poetry. Um, and yet, of course, um, it expressed some very strong emotions. And I would not deny uh, that it helped me a lot to develop a relationship, even with myself, how to cope with life. Okay. I think that's a very important sentence you mentioned here. If you say, okay, it helped me to cope with myself and life. Of that's course, that's an, an essential yeah. quote yes. right there. Yes, and and of course, I mean, we have to be careful here because what the statement I said can be interpreted as being, you know, an excessive form of narcissism. This is not. No, how I, I understand. How I mean it is, it is a way of relating to oneself through the writing. Mm -hmm. which allows you to express the feelings and the emotions and your thoughts um, in a way that the social circumstances around you do not allow you to express yourself in that but manner. But isn't then, because I heard you say for the second time good poetry, is it mentioning your feelings, overcoming your fears and helping you to find life? Isn't that kind of poetry also not being mentioned or qualified as good poetry? Okay, we need to distinguish, I think, between, between poetry, which is good for the writer because it is helping him or her move on and go mm -hmm. through the traumas. And then we need to distinguish good poetry in terms of creating vivid images, vivid metaphors that, that um, translate to other people, um, the emotions and the thoughts in a way which helps them to interpret in a rich way. And, and when I use those, and then of course there is the element of rhythm and musicality, when I look at those criteria, and I look at the poetry I was writing when I was 16, 17, in that regard, it was extremely weak, okay? But we have to start somewhere. I mean, and, and at least I had that private place where I could express myself in a way that I wanted without restrictions, and therefore it helped me to break the boundaries, okay? In a sense, I always say, in a sense, my experience of migration started when I started writing. Even before I was 23, when I physically migrated from Malta to Montreal. Mm -hmm. It started before when I started this process of breaking boundaries in my mind and in my heart. Is that why you called your first collection In Between? I, the, the reason why I call the first collection in between is because um, half of the collection was written prior to 1977 mm -hmm. when I left, and the other half was written between 1977 and 2000. I had also a collection of poetry ready to be published in August of 1977. It was called Il Ian in Maltese, which means in English, the depths. Depths, D-E-P-T-H-S, okay? Yeah. The depths. Um, uh, it had an introduction written by 
a very well-known professor who unfortunately passed away last November at the age of 74. And this is Professor Oliver Trigiri, who is a very renowned poet, novelist, um, cultural writer of, of Maltese language and literature. And, and, um, and um, it went to printing. Uh, I went to the printers and told them to stop. I paid them personally, I still remember, paid them 25 Malta pounds. Okay. <laughs> And, and I said, throw it away. I don't want to publish it. And I never published that book. But, and, and the Professor Frigiri uh, was very calm about it. He said, but why? I said, I'm leaving Malta. I have nothing to do with Malta. And, and that's it. So. That was the reason you want to break ties with Malta? I said, yes. I said, I, I want, there is no point of publishing. I'm leaving now. I'm leaving. That's it, and and um, and uh, and I never published it. Full stop. And I mean, I'm not unhappy that I did not publish it because when I look back, well, of course, it was 1977. Uh, the level of writing Maltese poetry writing from 77 till today has progressed a lot. So of course, you always have to look at the writing within the context of the time. Uh, but uh, I chose maybe from that book, I chose about six or seven poems that I included in between, in between. Okay. So you're also an educator. You, like you said, you lived for a long time in Canada, Toronto, Halifax, right? Uh, I'm Montreal, first Montreal, nine years. Yes. Then Halifax, 14 years, and then Toronto, 23 years. Wow. And there you worked on several schools as a professor. Uh, how yeah. did you include the poetry? Because that's a huge part of your identity. How did you include the poetry in education? Since I, I think it's a good question, um, uh, I, I always used poetry in my teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, even when I was a school teacher in Malta, uh, of course, I was a school teacher of Maltese uh, literature. So, of course, I used literature, of course, including poetry. Um, uh, and by the way, I was never enamored with this idea that there is one proper interpretation of poetry. Okay. I, I hated that. And, and I struggled with the students to encourage them to interpret what they read and they really, and even if I disagree with their interpretation. What was the struggle? Well, because, because most at that time, and I would dare say it is still the case now, many a times poetry is thought in a way, in a very moralizing way, which I think kills poetry. It kills poetry, mm -hmm. okay? And secondly, um, it is taught in a way uh, that gives the impression that there is a proper, one proper normal way how to understand what the author is saying in the poem, which is absolutely, excuse the language, utter bullshit, utter bullshit, okay? Uh, so I struggled to allow and encourage the students to express their own feelings in reaction to the poetry. And I didn't want them to be afraid to read the poem and say, this tells me nothing. I don't like it. I hate it. Okay, that's fine. You still get a hundred. Okay. And you write about that. But this was not the mentality at the time. All right. Yeah. Uh, but, but so what I'm saying is I tried to include poetry right even when I was a school teacher. And then when I started teaching at McGill, I remember I used to start every course I teach with a poem. And people are wondering, you know, students are wondering, like you could see it in their faces. This is not a literature class. Why are we st starting with a poem? Okay. And then eventually they get it because they start, of course, it would be a poem uh, purposely selected 
that would uh, that would connect with the theme of the course. And of course, I had the advantage of teaching philosophy of education, and therefore, poetry and philosophy go hand in hand. Okay? That's beautiful. So, what and do you uh, see then as your your biggest accomplishment while you you were a teacher? My biggest one of my well, I mean. I, I will tell you what I think my biggest accomplishment is. My biggest accomplishment is that I convinced the University of Toronto in the last eight years to develop a course under the Department of Social Justice Education, mm -hmm. uh, where, I where I used to teach. I still teach part-time to help, okay? Um, and they allowed me with open arms to develop a course on narratives of migration and exile, okay? And in this course, we read only, only novels and poetry. No academic stuff. But poetry and novels are very intellectual. And you know, from my other interview, I distinguish following the, the celebrated author, African-American author, Bell Hooks, mm -hmm. she distinguishes between the academic world and the intellectual world. And the two are not always meeting, okay? So my emphasis is on the intellectual rather than the academic. Can you shortly, for the people who didn't read or know about that interview, can you shortly distinguish the intellectual world and the academic world, well, how, the they how they describe it? The intellectual to me is really interested in its fullest sense in, in understanding boundaries, breaking boundaries and going beyond and truly inquiring and so on and so forth, okay? Yeah. Uh, not being afraid to deal with robust, controversial issues and all of these kinds of things, and bringing in a huge dosage of emotions and ideology. All of those, to me, are intertwined. The academic is different. The academic is supposed to be neutral, impartial, cold, rigid. Everything is in a box. It, it is like, I mean, you know, um, uh, it, it is like Thanatos. Mm -hmm. The intellectual is like Eros, and the other one is Thanatos. I don't <laughs> want fucking Thanatos. You know? I know what you mean, but the listeners really need to check up on their I mean, mythology right now. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, who wants Thanatos? You know, I mean, death. I mean, death in many ways. And how many times? As an administrator in my university career, I have to see souls of students and colleagues being totally destroyed to start believing and understanding that the academic is very mafioso, very mafioso. I mean, come on, you know, very mafioso. So I, I don't want to do with that. But they allowed me to develop a course where I can use literature and we focus only on migration and exile. And the students have the option to write either the usual formal essays, which is fine with me, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. or else to themselves write poetry, short stories. And, and I, in my experience teaching this course for the last eight years, 90% choose write creative writing. And they all say how liberating it was to write creative writing. You know? What was their motivation in that? What was there? Their motivation in, in choosing that course. The reason for choosing the course? Yes, yeah. Um, be because uh, many of them have experienced migration and exile. And therefore they are attracted to that. And of course they are attracted to the idea of narratives and counter- that Actually, yeah. that's actually where, where I was going through. So mm -hmm. it is, an ex again, a choice based on experience. 
which you can connect with sometimes traumatic experience or negative experience in life, which you can... Many, 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 many. And there are... There are so many stories I could tell about teaching this course. Like, for example, I mean, I'm not going to mention the names for ethical reasons, of course, but yeah, of course uh, a student of uh, Chinese descent, mm -hmm. okay, she was only two years old when she came to Canada. And, uh, and now, this was from two years ago. Now she must be about late 30s, okay, a teacher, and, and both parents of Chinese origin. And um, her parents never spoke to her as the only child about their immigrant experience. Okay. And she would always ask them and they would say, we don't want, we don't want, mm -hmm. we don't want. And then she took this course uh, and um, she started talking with her parents about the impact of what we are reading and the conversations. And I'm not taking credit because the conversations are created both by the novels and the poetry that we read, of course, and also by the people taking the class who, bring, who are courageous enough to bring in their experiences and talk about them. You know, and I, I talk about mine as well. And, and we bring in all of this. Um, and eventually her parents opened up. That's and, an amazing uh, achievement. It is amazing. It was a huge cathartic moment, I think, both for her uh, and for her parents. And she totally understood when they told her why they did not want to talk about it because the experience was so painful, so painful. Both the experience of leaving and the experience of coming to Canada and what they had to experience in their first uh, few years of life in Canada. Uh, and she said, you know, I cried with them. And she said, uh, I fully understand now why they did not want to tell their story and yet, the fact that now she knows their story was extremely helpful for her in understanding um, uh, the relationship with her own parents and in being able to grow in that relationship. Yeah, you know? it's really, yeah, traumatic growth and healing. Yeah. So, making so this, would be, this would be an example of healing that I did not plan it, but I knew that such things could happen. Okay. I think I think I have a, a quote you said in your last interview that is brilliant at this moment to close up with, and that's um, we can't abandon the luggage, however you can conceive it. Yes, of course, exactly. I think exactly. I think that says it all. Also, what yes, you yes. just told you can about. you can conceal it or try to conceal it, and in my view. Um, Concealing the luggage is a huge mistake, huge mistake. Now, of course, to reveal the luggage, you have to be very cautious because not all contexts will accept your luggage, okay? So you, you have to be very careful. You have to be very careful. I mean, uh, the example that comes to mind, and it's not the only one, so I don't want to create a stereotype, but for example, with transgender students, uh, they hide it because not many contexts will accept that they are transgender. Okay? Absolutely. But in contexts where they are accepted, of course, they will open up and remove their luggage. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, but I think uh, hiding the luggage can be extremely painful and extremely unhealthy. And yet, of course, there is always always the politics of the context and we cannot say oh all contexts are the same you disregard it ah, ha, ha, ha. you cannot disregard it it is it is only those who live an elite um, life who live a, a privileged life who who can say that and yet at the same time i'm not afraid to say that concealing the luggage is very negative okay so yeah. 
Thank you so but much. Of for course, then, then, of course, there is one other thing which I have developed in other intellectual work, published intellectual work, not literature, uh, which are two or three articles on what I refer to as the ethics of subversion. Okay. Why? And Why did you choose that? Because subversion traditionally in the liberal European Anglo-Saxon tradition mm -hmm. is seen to be something negative. While subversion in and of itself is not bad or okay. good. Subversion is good or bad depending on the context and depending on the aim. Okay, so the classic example, of course, is within Nazi Germany. Okay, if I am hiding a Jewish family in my basement and the police knocks on my door and they ask me, John, are you hiding a Jewish family? And I say, oh, okay, okay, I have to be truthful. Yes, I am hiding. Bullshit. This is not being truthful. To be truthful to my values, I have to be subversive to the police and convince them that I am not hiding, okay? Because to be truthful, I have to live according to my values. And my values tell me that I should be saving a Jewish life and not killing it. You understand? I understand so completely. in this context, subversion becomes very virtuous, very virtuous, okay? Now, when we understand this, we understand that there are moments in life where we have to hide certain things and pretend, okay, because the politics of the context is such that if we make it very explicit, we are shot at, killed immediately, okay? All mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the ethics of subversion comes back to the role of transgression of literature. Because true subversion, for good ethical reasons, of course, good ethical reasons, okay? Look, it is very justifiable. The mafia flourishes on subversion, okay? The mafia flourishes on subversion. They go to church, they give money to the church, they give money to the poor. Oh, look how virtuous they are. Ah, they do this to hide, okay? But the intention is otherwise, okay? Mm -hmm. while, while if I am protecting a student from the neoliberal fascist bureaucracy of a contemporary university, okay? My intention is not like that of the matter. My intention is to save the life and the well-being of the student. And to me, that takes priority over the elitism and privilege of the bloody academic. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think uh, this last part was the most interesting part for me, if I speak personally. I, think I hope that... it is interesting in the full sense. I, I know what you mean. Interest. I know what you, mean. you want what interest means? Yes. Interest comes from two Latin words, inter and est. Inter meaning among, between, est means to be. So when you say this is of inter-est, it means it connects with your being. Ha! That's a very strong claim, okay? Very strong claim. Not like the British who tell me, give a talk, and they say, oh, that's interesting, John. Okay, <laughs> what they mean is either they disagree with me, and they don't have the balls to tell me they disagree, okay? Or they didn't get my point and they are afraid to say, I don't get your point. So they say, oh, that's interesting. Well, it's not interesting. Do you think that's, that's, that's um, a thing that is most common, fear? Of course. Fear of course. that it's not only... Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and academia reproduces itself through fear. Oh, of course. I truly enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Simone. Me too. Thank you very much for all you your, are most your wisdom. You Thank are you. most welcome.
wisdom. It's no, 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 no. It's not wisdom. It's madness. It's madness. There is a difference between wisdom and madness. Well, that's a thin line. Madness is the epitome of wisdom. (laughs) (laughs) Another one to think about. Yes, and in, in Dutch you say cruel, cruel, right? Crazy is cruel. Uh, cru- um, yeah, time cruel. Cruel. <laughs> cruel. And in Belgian, French, très très fou. Okay. <laughs> I know it in about 40 languages, you know. Since it's the epitome of wisdom, I have to know this very important word. In Turkish, chok deli. Now you know it in 40 languages. What? And now you know it in 40 languages. Well, only this word. (laughs) (laughs) That's extraordinary. We had better stop because I think I am transgressing beyond the transgression now. No. Thank (laughs) you very much for... You are welcome, Simone. You are most welcome. And I wish you the very best in your career. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. And in your life, of course, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. I wish you the same. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.